Spoiler! The biggest problem with any crewed mission isn't the rocket, the spacecraft, or the engine, it's the passenger. For the engineer designing a space mission, the human is the most unstable, expensive, and unpredictable component in the whole system. Our metabolism fluctuates, our memory fails, our bodies come in millions of possible variations, and when something breaks, there's no fixing it with a wrench. Repairing a human can take weeks. On top of that, you have to account for every detail that keeps us alive – water, oxygen, food, and extra propellant just to push all that mass into orbit. Solar panels and thrusters are easy creatures. They don't panic, don't need a bathroom, don't fall in love with the commander, don't have an ego, don't need sleep or entertainment, don't ask to take the kids for a walk in the woods. Their structures don't give in microgravity, and they work fine even after sleepless nights, because they don't have nights or sleep. They also don't need to breathe. The comparison is uncomfortable, but honest. Hardware is obedient, we are not. Even so, many people firmly believe humanity's future lies beyond Earth, in orbital megastructures, colonies on the lunar surface, or underground cities and glass domes on Mars. The uncomfortable question is, is that actually desirable for a human being? The answer I defend here is no. And throughout this video I'll show why, point by point, without romanticizing how harsh space really is. In recent decades, space exploration has stopped being the monopoly of Cold War superpowers. More than 70 countries now run space programs, and at least 16 have mastered some launch capability. The new element is the private sector. Companies like SpaceX kicked off a competition that reignited public interest. Elon Musk often repeats his dream of making humanity multiplanetary, permanently. NASA itself wants to send astronauts back to the moon within a few years and is investing heavily in the Artemis program, which aims to establish continuous human presence beyond Earth. After more than half a century of apparent stagnation, a lot of people talk as if living out there were an inevitable step, almost written in the stars, and above all, feasible. Where does that certainty come from? Partly from the awe inspired by the hundreds of billions of exoplanets we now know exist. It's tempting to imagine the universe as a catalog, a perfect planet for every taste, lovely to dream about, terrible for planning when the subject is concrete reality because, from a physical standpoint, the obstacle that sinks almost every plan is simple to state and nearly impossible to overcome. Distance. Beyond the solar system, the scales are so vast that, given everything we currently understand about nature, achievable speeds will remain far below light speed. And even if we approached it, the distances would still be absurd. The conclusion is harsh and, at the same time, liberating. Perhaps we're not alone in the cosmos, but we are isolated, and that has huge practical implications. Okay, then we stay in the solar system. Even so, there's nowhere that truly resembles Earth. The favorite candidate, Mars, is far more hostile than the popular narrative admits. A seductive discourse has taken root about a new Wild West, a planet ready to be terraformed, colonized, reset. It sounds epic. It isn't true when confronted with the facts. Getting there is already a bigger challenge than anything we've done. The Moon, our only crewed destination so far, is days away. Mars is not. The trip is long, complex, expensive, and the stay demands an order of magnitude jump in engineering and logistics. And that's without mentioning the main point. The human body wasn't made for space. Prolonged exposure to the space environment damages DNA, alters the microbiome, scrambles circadian rhythms, affects vision, sometimes permanently, increases cancer risk, causes loss of muscle and bone mass, depresses the immune system, weakens the heart, and shifts fluids toward the head. An effect that, over the long term, can be dangerous for the brain. That's just the short list. Space medicine has learned to mitigate some of these harms, but mitigate is not eliminate. And Mars adds another layer of complications. If we don't radically adapt the brain and body to the Martian environment, the red planet will remain, in practice, beyond the limits of what humans can tolerate. And that logic applies even more strongly to other worlds in the solar system, or to giant space stations. It's not a lack of technology in the strict sense, it's a matter of sanity, purpose, and quality of life. Who, in their right mind, would choose to live forever in a hostile, artificial environment? Even with this argument, I'm going easy. I'm not even getting into fantasies about colonizing worlds like Titan. 
for now. The distances alone already make that story a one-way trip for crewed missions. We can, and should, send probes and robots. But station people there? Forget it. Let's be clear. We are not going to settle Mars. Maybe we'll do something on the moon, yes. Bases staffed by a few specialists, with periodic rotations, like research stations in Antarctica. And that's it. Why isn't Mars habitable? Let's start with the atmosphere. It's about 0.6% of sea level pressure on Earth, equivalent to what we'd find here at roughly 35 kilometers altitude. Under those conditions, liquid water doesn't remain stable on the surface. The upper layer of soil, a fine, dusty regolith, is contaminated by perchlorates, substances highly toxic to organisms like ours. The thin air is dominated by carbon dioxide and, besides being unbreathable, it's terrible at shielding the surface from solar and cosmic radiation. Result? A world that is, for practical purposes, biologically sterile. Add to that the atmosphere's inefficiency at retaining heat. Average temperatures hover around minus 63 degrees Celsius, about minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit, and extremes plunge even lower. In contrast, Earth balances around 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a different game. But what about domes? To survive, we'd need a habitable bubble that handles several functions at once. Recreate an atmosphere with adequate oxygenation, maintain pressure that preserves bodily integrity, shield against radiation, and support daily needs. The size of that bubble grows with the number of people and the length of stay. At minimum, each astronaut would need a pressurized suit, enough for a few hours, like a spacewalk on the ISS or the moon. To house a group for months, we'd need a module with everything. Sleeping areas, kitchen, bathrooms, storage, air and water recycling systems, redundancies, equipment. And the bigger the bubble, the more complex and expensive the challenges become, to the point of near prohibitive. Even if one day we work around part of the technical problems, a silent sentence hangs over all these dreams. Our deep aversion to anything that separates us from the simple act of opening a window and breathing fresh air. Life in a Martian colony would mean people confined to underground bases lit artificially or to heavily shielded surface stations, with access to the outside severely limited heavy suits, rigid protocols, no forests, no wind in your face, no rain, no beach, no hiking trail, disconnected from the nature that shaped us. Would you sign up for that? and thousands of people, as some plans suggest. Even with so many barriers, the idea of colonizing Mars soon has become a mantra. Elon Musk talks about establishing colonies around 2050, calculating the number of rockets needed to carry tens of thousands of settlers. The United Arab Emirates even floated the ambition of a Martian city with hundreds of thousands of inhabitants in the 22nd century. A plan that, at the very least, borders on the fantastic. The narrative often comes hand in hand with another seductive concept, terraforming. Terraforming, simply put, is the hypothesis of reshaping a planet to make it suitable for us and other life forms. In Mars's case, that would mean injecting oxygen and other substances into the atmosphere, warming the surface, increasing pressure, perhaps melting ice, releasing gases trapped in minerals, the whole package. A common argument is, Colonization is the first step toward terraforming. Except, as serious researchers note, terraforming Mars is for now a dream. A prospect far beyond what technology will allow anytime soon. And it's not just technology, it's logistics. Recent studies have tried to estimate how much carbon dioxide would be required to raise the pressure enough for a human to work outdoors without a pressurized suit and, at the same time, raise the temperature to keep liquid water on the surface. The conclusion is discouraging for enthusiasts. Mars probably doesn't have enough available CO2 to do it. In other words, future terraformers would need to import gases in colossal quantities. To be fair, terraforming isn't an absolute impossibility in the philosophical sense, but the timescales and engineering levels involved push any scenario of large, vibrant colonies far beyond the foreseeable horizon. Until then, an unterraformed Mars will remain a hostile environment that, at best, might receive one or two human missions with a strong political strategic slant. I'll confidently bet we will visit Mars and come back home. And once the euphoria passes, we won't try again for a long while.
The idea that a few incursions will, by inertia, blossom into settlements of hundreds or thousands of people denies the enormity of the challenges. But humans are irreplaceable in the field. Robots don't have our intuition. That used to be true. And it's changing. Probes and rovers have been making generational leaps that speed up knowledge gains. They don't eat, don't drink, don't need Earth-like atmospheric pressure. Minimal protection for electronics is enough. And the cost? The recurring estimate is that a single human mission would be equivalent, budget-wise, to dozens of robotic missions on the scale of Perseverance. Something on the order of 40 to 1. Add to that onboard artificial intelligence. Very soon, these vehicles will be able to recognize complex patterns at first glance. Like telling an ordinary rock from a fossil. Scientific efficiency, per dollar invested and risk assumed, is tilting more and more toward machines. This is where two blind spots meet. On one side, there's the tendency to overestimate a future with humans at the center of every achievement, underestimating how deeply our nature rejects extreme artificial environments. On the other, there's resistance to facing the obvious. Machines are gaining autonomy, precision, and eyes that surpass ours in specific tasks, including doing science. In parallel, the current narrative tries to push down some inconvenient truths. Space travel will likely remain expensive, difficult, and dangerous for centuries. Space, almost by definition, is cold and inhospitable. Making it friendlier with habitats, domes, or terraforming requires solving dozens of massive problems and will cost too much for too long until it loses momentum for lack of motivation. In that scenario, robots fill the gap. Traveling to other stars? If it happens, it won't be for hundreds of years. Contact with alien intelligences? If it comes, it may be just the whisper of a distant transmission, and not for many centuries. Perhaps never. That pushes us toward heavy philosophical questions. If we don't end up living on Mars, if living in space remains an exception, are we destined to be a sedentary species? And if other technological civilizations, no matter how advanced, follow the same logic, preferring not to betray their own biological nature to venture into hostile environments? That hypothesis fits one possible answer to the Fermi paradox. If the universe teems with life, where is everybody? Maybe truly mature species are those that let go of predatory ambitions written in their DNA and choose a long-term path, balancing broad well-being with preserving their home world and reducing environmental impact over time. The cosmic silence, then, wouldn't indicate early extinctions, but wisdom. To endure, you have to burn slowly. Perhaps we don't see them precisely because they've learned to live well while making less noise. So, should we give up on space? Not at all. The conclusion is different. Earth is our real space arc, and taking care of it isn't the opposite of doing science in the cosmos. On the contrary, we should plan, build, and launch increasingly capable automated missions that represent us with dignity and precision in environments where our presence would be expensive, risky, and, ultimately, counterproductive. Colonial fervor, on the other hand, is likely to lose strength over time, not for lack of courage, but for lack of purpose and cost-effectiveness. I know this view cools the imagination a bit, and paradoxically strengthens it, because it frees the mind from the myth of the inevitable exodus and invites us to think big where it truly makes a difference. In ambitious automated missions, in telescopes that can read exoplanet atmospheres, in networks of probes that patiently sweep subsurface oceans, in laboratories that turn raw data into knowledge. In the end, it all circles back to the initial question, what's the cost of putting a human at the center of environments we weren't made for? I don't mean just money, but lifetime, health, happiness. The harshness of microgravity, relentless radiation, unforgiving confinement, the absence of open sky, all these details added up remind us that space is an excellent place for robots and a terrible home for us. If the goal is to learn, explore, and push the frontiers of knowledge, there's no shame in accepting that machines can and should take the lead. So yes, we'll keep launching rockets, sending probes farther, refining instruments, and testing technologies that might, in some distant day, make other possibilities less remote. But we'll do it without selling illusions of cities under domes on Mars in the next generation. And without ignoring the fact that science has told us for decades that space exacts a steep price for every minute of human presence.
Between the romance of a new home and the pragmatism of robotic exploration, the balance, this century and the next, tilts toward the side that delivers more knowledge with less suffering. In the end, the choice isn't between giving up or dreaming. It's about dreaming with focus. Humanity can stay curious, bold, and inspiring without condemning itself to life locked inside pressurized bubbles millions of kilometers from home. But I want to hear from you. Do you think humanity will reach the stars, or at least our solar system, within this century? Leave your opinion in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.